Hey everybody, it is Patrick McLean, one of your hosts for Reimagine 2020. Uh, as you guys know, we've been going for around 72 hours. Now, I don't know what point you're catching this. Uh, we're super lucky to have a lot of interesting conversations, right? So whether it's with students, whether it's with uh, blockchain infrastructure companies, um, industry, kind of how they're utilizing it, or, you know, guests that I'm really excited if, uh, to hear from right now, you know, kind of uh, how people are using it at, at the, uh, you know, governmental level, uh, how it's really impacting um, societies around the world. So before I butcher it, and I want to turn out to butcher your name, but uh, Chopay, uh, if you want, if I hopefully I got that right, if you want to introduce yourself. Uh, where, where are you at right now? How's your day going and, uh, and how's life? Hi everyone. So my name is Shokwe Williams Elebe. I'm a law professor in Stellenbosch University, which is in, in, in Cape Town in South Africa. Um, so I'm based here in Cape Town. It's a beautiful day today. We're still at the tail end of our winter, so it's a little bit cold, which is why I'm wearing a jumper. Um, so I teach law. Um, but the area of law that I focus on is public procurement law, which is government contracts law. Um, and of course, if you read anything in the midst of this pandemic, everything about government contracts seems to involve some kind of corruption. So my area of interest is government contracts law and, and anti-corruption, I should say. Um, and so that's basically what I do in my, you know, in my day job. I teach government contracts law. I teach anti-corruption law. Um, I do consulting, trying to figure out ways that we can make government contracts less corrupt um, and, and have better outcomes for, for citizens. Definitely. And, and, you know, I want to kind of ask more questions about how you're really looking to apply blockchain. Um, but before we go there, uh, you know, I, one of the things I always find interesting when we started to help reaching out to universities, you know, at first I expected a lot of primarily blockchain developers, which there are, uh, or kind of at universities around the world and there are blockchain clubs. And then, uh, you know, what I started noticing was that there was a lot of law students, actually, that were kind of crossing across the table. And that was one thing I wasn't actually projecting. Um, so can, can you maybe talk a little bit like, you know, what, where do you think those lines are? You know, what, what kind of drew you um, to be interested in blockchain as you were studying law? And, and where do you think those parallels are? Like, do you think it's going to be something more and more interesting for, for a variety of fields or studies? Um, right. Okay. So I'll, th there wasn't any blockchain when I was studying law because I, I, I studied law uh, 25 years ago. So there wasn't any blockchain. Um, and yeah, so but my, my interest in blockchain, I think, came from from the anti-corruption work that I do. So, of course, for governments, a lot of the discussion around reducing corruption in, in procurement or in, in the public sector generally has focused for the last, I'll say, 15, 20 years, has focused on the use of technology. So in public procurement, we talk about e-procurement platforms. We talk about um, measures that we can use to limit the um, interaction between public officials and, um, you know, and, and government contractors to, to limit the opportunities for corruption. So when, the, when, when there was, um, or when the information on blockchain became you know, or when the noise I should say about blockchain became overwhelming. And of course, everyone was saying that, you know, this is basically the, the best thing since sliced bread, it will eliminate the middleman, it will eliminate, you know, um, issues of discretion and, and corruption, et cetera, et cetera. I began to look at it from a legal perspective. As I said, I'm a law professor. So obviously trying to understand, okay, what really is blockchain? What are the benefits that it can provide? How can it be used in the government procurement um, space um, to really, you know, make, make a chain, make differences. I said already that I'm in, in South Africa, and of course, a lot of African countries have issues with corruption in their public sector, especially with corruption in, in government contracts. Um, so that was really my interest was like, how can we use this technology? How can it be used in a way that can help us to improve the outcomes we have in public procurement and reduce corruption at the same time? So that was the angle that I, I, came, I came to it from. All right. So when, and I'm always surprised when I see people kind of approach blockchain, whether it's a large corporation or, you know, I think we've even gone through startup phases where a lot of startups kind of tried to apply it to their technology, whether it was actually the best use case or not. Uh, so I think sometimes, at least in the past, it's been thrown around as a buzzword. So where did you kind of land on that from hearing like this is the best thing from sliced bread and it's going to cure every problem and then kind of fell down to maybe earth a little bit and seeing how it's actually applied. What was that journey like for you? What did you learn along the way? 
Um, okay, so what, what I learned along the way, I'd say, so definitely as a technology, it's, it's, it could be very useful. Um, but I, I, I would say that it hasn't so far lived up to its potential. And there are a number of, of, of reasons for this, depending on which you know, sector you're in. So in, in government contracts, there is one of the, I say one of the challenges we have is that there is, there are a lot of phases, there are a lot of stages and there are a lot of, there's a lot of official documentation that needs to be used. Now, converting that kind of information into the blockchain has been, has been one of the barriers to using blockchain in procurement. So we haven't really seen it being ad adopted as the technology for public procurement. What we have seen is that it's been used for um, micro phases in the procurement process. You know, so I'll give an example. In Costa Rica, they use blockchain, um, they, they, or they've integrated blockchain into their, I'll say, regular electronic procurement platform um, in order to secure some documents because they found that on that e-procurement platform they had, people could still tamper with certain documents, um, you know, for, you know, for, um, for unethical reasons. So they essentially just secured some of the documentation that was crucial on a blockchain part. Um, into their e-procurement technology. Um, so there have been different, um, as I said, different reasons why we haven't seen wholesale adoption of blockchain across the entire procurement value chain, if you want to say that. So part of it is because there's a lot of documentation that has to be used. Um, and part of it is the fact that there, there are many stages in a procurement process and some of those stages are regulated by law in a way that does not make it amenable to, um, you know, to a fully automated, um, fully online um, event. Um, another reason why we haven't seen the wholesale adoption, and I'll say this for South Africa, I, I don't know if it applies to other countries, but in South Africa, there isn't any... Um, or the, the procurement laws don't allow for any kind of um, electronic um, decision adjudication. So any, any litigation that doesn't go to the high court um, in procurement is just not allowed. So if there's a procurement dispute, it has to go to the high court. You can't have any kind of you know, um, mechanism whereby disputes are settled in an electronic format. Um, so that's just not allowed. So it also means that whatever you do on the blockchain has to be able to be translated to, um, you know, real world litigation. Um, and, and, and in that case, you're talking about like a physical signature almost. I mean, yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, so you're not, not, not just signatures, but you're talking about the fact that if you're going to, of course, if, if disputes, I, I mean, they're, they're, I suppose they're workarounds, but if a dispute is going to court on a matter that was wholly, electronic you have to be able to have access to those documents because that's what the judges are going to look at so the evidence has to be able to cut to be translated into a form that you know lawyers and judges can can read um, and it has to be able to be pr printed out almost. yes you have so and so so when it comes to so you you, you so you can contemplate a, a system where we do everything on you know on a, a blockchain platform or any other kind of technological platform, but once we're not, once there's a dispute, then everything has to be taken off this platform and brought into, you know, into people's hands. Um, so it kind of makes it less efficient than you would have it be. Um, so there's no, there, yeah. So there's just no space for um, for dispute resolution that can take place, you know, within the technology. There's just no. There's no scope for that. So it almost sounds at, at this moment, at least I guess in South Africa, I'd say it's meant to be complementary almost, like not, not the, yeah. got it. All right. Yeah. So, well, I mean, how, how are you thinking about that then as a lawyer? I mean, do you think that there is a long tail approach that is like changing the laws almost to adapt to this digital format? Yeah. So that, that, that yeah. So that, there are two things. Um, so changing the law would be necessary because I said the law just does not allow certain things. So in, so the long game would be that, that there would be pressure on 
um, adapting the laws or changing the laws so that there's more scope for using technology broadly, not just blockchain, but technology broadly. So that's number right. one. Well, well and not, not to cut you off, but I, I think I, I was actually thinking about that when you were saying, I think even if you go back to like DocuSign, right? I think DocuSign had to go through the same process. It was like, at, you know, even the states are, at what point did courts accept a digitally signed version yeah. versus a physically signed version? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so, yeah, so, yeah, that's, a, that's a good analogy. So it will be that, you know, when we've moved quite a bit, I mean, you know, we, we, we accept electronic signatures. Um, we're even now um, allowing people to register their properties on, on, you know, but, you know, through technology without actually using physical documents. So there's been movement, but in government procurement, one of the problems we have is that because it's so highly regulated, there's so many um, blocks to, you know, there's so many blocks and there's also resistance. So as I said, the first thing would be like changing the law to make the law more, um, more amenable to the use of technology. Um, and then the second thing would be on the practical side in, in South Africa, and I, I suppose in, in, in a few um, other developing countries, we also don't, we, we're not very good in terms of our data management and our use of data. So the kind of data that you need to make technology platforms useful, we don't actually <laughs> properly collate or manage that data. So even changing our data management practices, um, making that a, a um, an important part of the work that we do in the public sector, I think is important because you know if you're using any technology platform, the data is everything. The data you're putting into it is you know, makes it work. And if, if we don't have that data, if we're not collating that data, if we don't know what to do with that data, then we're, you know, we're having the garbage in, garbage out, um, you know, no you know, situation. So those are the two things that I think need to be addressed in this context. So one would be the, the legislation, making sure that the legal framework is actually favorable to the use of technology. Um, and, and the second would be actually changing the, the public sector practices in, in relation to data. Right. Um, so I, I guess let's talk about how, what you're doing specifically then. So then you kind of have some ideas of, of how to approach this. Can you talk about like some of the, the actions you're taking, maybe some of the pilots that you're working on, et cetera? Yes. Okay. So, um, so it's, it's still, I mean, even though there are challenges, there's, you know, anything that is new, that is cutting edge has to go through, <laughs> has to go through the fire, right. And, and, and be refined. So I'm still very optimistic. And in South Africa right now, there are two pilots, two blockchain pilots that I'm part of. Um, and both of them are, are in public procurement. So one of them is with a little, um, what we call a municipality. So it's like, um, it's like local government, basically, um, to try to see, and, and the, the aim of that first pilot is to try to see if we're going to actually put procurement on the, on the blockchain, what does that look like? what are the obstacles that we would face? How would we, and then more importantly, how would we make sure that we are compliant with the, the legislation, with the laws on, on how to conduct procurement? I said already that the procurement in South Africa is really highly regulated. So uh, just to, to put into context, there are about 40 different laws that address public procurement in South Africa. So there's, it's a lot. So making sure that, and those laws, some of them conflict <laughs> in, in the real world. So making sure that we can do that on a blockchain is itself a challenge. So we have this this pilot um, in, a in a municipality which we call Swellendam. So it's a really tiny municipality, and we you know we went for that municipality because it's small, because um, you know it's small. It's you know it's 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 um, it means that we can actually have more freedom to to move and to explore, um, you know, um, and to see what it is that that we can do. So we've been trying to make sure that we could. Um, move the, 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 the procurement documentation that needs to be used, that we could put that on a blockchain to see what the, so the, the, the whole focus, of course, has been on building the platform, uh, making sure that the back end works, uh, which is everything. So where we were supposed to go live in July, but we had some delays because of, obviously, of, of COVID-19. Um, so that's kind of, it's still in, in the works, but things slowed down because in South Africa, we had a really, a really, really hard lockdown, and that was only eased um, a couple of weeks ago. So we're only kind of getting back, not even to normal, but to, to you know, to working again. Um, so that's the first one. 
So with that, the idea with that, as I said, is just to see what it would look like, what, what would be the obstacles we come um, against and which obstacles we can actually deal with and which would actually mean that we would need legislation, legislative reform. Um, so that's the first one. And I said, that's been going on. Actually, it's been on since last year because they, you know, it was self-funded. So we've been building this platform um, organically. Um, so that's the first one. Then the second one is a, a bit more exciting because it's, um, it's funded by, by an international donor um, and it includes, so it's again, another p um, pilot, um, but now with one of the biggest um, government departments in, in South Africa. So basically the government department that, that has the biggest budget. <laughs> so we're, we're really at two ends of the spectrum dealing with the tiniest um, you know, local government office and then one of the biggest government departments. So again, this one is supposed to start in October. Um, and again, the idea is to see what can we do, especially with this department, as I said, they have the biggest budget and they have the most corruption. <laughs> um, so it's just to see what can we do. And with the pandemic, you know, the amount of corruption that's gone on has just been heartbreaking, really heartbreaking. So the idea again is for this one is to see how can we make it better in this department? How can we put their processes on a platform that will minimize the risks for corruption, minimize the amount of money that is being lost, um, and, and you know, minimize, some of the, the, minimize the waste and the inefficiencies that we currently have? Um, so that, that is very exciting because, because it's such a big department, it's going to be, you know, it's going to be make national and even international news once, it's, once it goes live. So fingers crossed that it goes well. <laughs> That is not, you know, that it's, it makes good international news and not, not negative news. Um, but both yeah. are very exciting. So my, my role, my role, um, especially in the larger one, is to make sure that whatever they do um, does not breach South African law. Because, of course, you can't have a platform that is <laughs> illegal, right. you know, or that makes your processes illegal. So, as I said, just making sure that we are, we are legally compliant, um, you know, as well as being technologically efficient is is going to be the thing. So it's quite exciting, um, a lot of challenges, but but it's still very exciting. And yeah, I think the future is bright. <laughs> well, I, I wanna ask you a question about um, kind of homegrown, you know, what, what's, what are, is there any participation like at the university level or interests actually people on the ground? But before I get to that, you know, one point that you said, and curious, right? So I imagine that there's a little bit of uh, pushback, right? Because you, you, you have to work with departments that have the most corruption with the biggest budgets, but you're introducing something to stop their corruption. So do you find that yeah. that is a kind of a vicious cycle? Like, are they really motivated to help you or, or only certain people? Um, certain people, certain people, there is a lot of resistance. There's a lot of pushback because, you know, in essentially you're going to be taking food out of their mouths, <laughs> even though it's not their food. <laughs> but you're going to be taking food out of them. So there is a lot of resistance and that, that adds a layer of, of complexity. Um, but the, the, the thing is that once you have, once you have the cooperation of certain key people, then the, the effect of the resistance is, is much less. Um, yeah. Uh, well, and, and I mean, like you said, like you guys have already been installing and I'm sure this is similar for many, you know, different countries, but it sounds like you guys have already been implementing digital solutions, whether it was on blockchain, right, to kind of help with the procurement process. So, I mean, I would imagine that it's not foreign to say that there's going to be some technology layer to facilitate yeah. things. So yeah. at some points, the people almost want to wrap their arms around it so they can control it a little bit more rather than fighting it. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, true. Got it. So yeah, so no, the use of technology is not, you know, it's not the use of technology is not new. Um, but it's just the the, the kind of um of, of audit trail that, that the blockchain leaves that you don't get with other platforms is, sure. is kind of what makes it you know what makes it different. Um and I think one I suppose a positive is that because many regular folk don't really understand what the blockchain is, it's easier in some cases to deploy because is there is there any conception like do they think bitcoin do they think currency do you ever run into that yeah oh yeah no all the time so people only know bitcoin um or, or digital currencies so they they know or cryptocurrencies so they have that but they don't really get what the platform what the technology itself is about beyond sure. the scope of, of, of cryptocurrencies 
Um, and yeah, so, and, and then you, you asked the question about the university. Um, so we have, so as I think you've said already, in many universities, you have blockchain clubs. Now, my university just last, last year um, set up a school for, for data science and computational thinking. Um, so it's a, a cross faculty center rather or school, which, you know, does programs in, in this area, you know, blockchain, AI, um, you know, big data. So teaching that basically because there is a gap, many universities haven't, or at least maybe this side of the world, haven't been able to really pivot um, to provide the kind of content that young people need at the university level in, in, in relation to these technologies. Um, so there is a gap um, and it means that young people have to find that knowledge for themselves. It's not something that you can pick up in a university um, because you know, we're just not teaching it, but we're starting to now. So there is still, it's still very new. It's still very new. Even, I mean, when I started um, researching in blockchain and I started talking to my classes about it, I was really surprised to find that, you know, I mean, I, I think of myself as an old fogey, but the, 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 the students didn't know anything about blockchain. I thought that they would be explaining it to me like properly in class, but many of them- Almost, knew. almost no one knows anything about blockchain. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's weird. So they, they had heard about Bitcoin and they had a vague idea what it was, but in terms of what the technology actually was, many of them didn't know. And I thought, you know, you guys are online from the moment you wake up. <laughs> Surely you've seen this, you know, <laughs> you've seen this somewhere. So there is still, um, there's, there's still a lot of, of the, um, of confusion about it and not a lot of awareness about the technology itself beyond um, crypto. Got it. And um, I, I think kind of zoom out, maybe not so much even about blockchain use cases, um, you know, something I'm always intrigued, um, you know, I, I, I know many different parts of Africa, right? We were talking before this, like I used to live in East Africa for a bit, um, which I saw like M-Pesa kind of there a decade mm -hmm. ago, right? And so I'm always intrigued, like, how quickly and i think a lot of international audience doesn't really quite understand at least from the perspective that i've seen which is how quick africa kind of adopts technology in certain cases even faster than, than most countries i think um what are the general feeling and, and again I, I know south africa isn't the same as east africa or west africa but like uh, can you speak to kind of your general experience uh, just general blockchain adoption whether it's on the currency side etc you know what is What's the sentiment, um, I guess, in South Africa, or if you want to speak to Nigeria, where you're from? Um. Um, okay, so um, so on the on the crypto side, there's definitely been um, a lot of adoption, and that has even increased with the pandemic. Um, but mainly for you know speculative and investment purposes. Um, so of course, there isn't adoption of crypto as you know as a, a means of exchange, at least not 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 widely done. So, but, but there are definitely people investing in it, you know, um, and holding on to it to, 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 you know, as, as a form of investment. Um, so that's, so that's there. Um, in terms of blockchain, um, not, not so much, not in the private, in the public sector, not in the pub, not in the public sector at all. Um, in the private sector, I'm not sure that we, we've heard of a few, um, you know, platforms being um, sold here and there or being used. Um, but I, I can't say, I don't think it's that prevalent at all. So not, not blockchain as a technology, but crypto, yes, there's a lot more acceptance of that, understanding of what that means and people, you know, ordinary people having, you know, having their crypto wallets and, and you know, holding on to that is definitely not, not unusual. But the technology itself, um, for other things, not really. Got it. Well, hey, uh, this is actually one of those conversations that I wish I had more time. I have to. I have another one in a minute, and I think we're we're running a little bit over here. But before we go, um, you know, there's again, there's a lot of students watching this. I think I know government people watching this, etc. What would you tell, like, so if you're a student today, like going to school for law or something like that, how would you tell students uh, if if you were just starting school again today, how would you tell students to kind of think about integrating blockchain into their mindset? Um, and then maybe a little zoomed out, you know, other countries or um, kind of public policy people working through blockchain, what might be some advice you have for them as they think about approaching it? Okay, so for students, I, I would definitely say 
um, they should be interested in anything to do with technology, irrespective of what they're studying. So if you're studying law, you must understand how technology affects law. Um, I mean, you must understand how, how AI influences the law now. Um, and so you must definitely take an interest in, in blockchain, in technology, in coding. Um, you know, you, you, you must have an interest. Otherwise, you will be an old fogey before you graduate. You will be obsolete before you graduate. So you, you, don't, you don't have an option anymore. Um, and for the, the same thing, I'll say to, to people in the public sector, technology is here. Um, we either adopt it and make it useful to us or it will overwhelm us. It will then be that we are, you know, we are stragglers and we, are, we continue to be inefficient in a world that has moved on. So I would definitely say that in the public sector, they should examine um, closely how technologies like blockchain, how technologies like AI can make life better, can make life more efficient, um, can make life less expensive. Uh, because that's the point. Technology is supposed to make our lives better. And the public sector has a mandate to actually make citizens' lives better. So there is a, a convergence of, of, um, of interests and they need to be, be thinking about it and thinking about how technology can, can work for all of us. Very well said. Well, I, we definitely appreciate your time. And for everybody watching, uh, keep tuning in. Let's continue to have some really great conversations. And uh, hopefully you guys are learning a lot and we'll keep this thing going. It's very nice to talk with you, Chopin. Thank you so much. It was great to talk to you as well.